Well, today we're going to go a little bit deeper in this journey of the servant life. And as we do that uh, in this salt journey of serving and leading together, um, it's important for us to know what the foundational element is, the key element that I think is the driver for everything else, and that is the gift, the lifestyle, uh, the rocket fuel of love. Love, 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 right? This is what we're called to be and to do. And the challenge for the church is actually to make love loved again. Because I don't know about you, again, we look out there in the world and not a lot of the behavior of the lifestyle, the pattern, the way of being for people is a lifestyle of love. And I have felt ill the last several weeks with the way we talk about each other, the way we act toward one another, uh, the kinds of ways that are communicated amongst how a people of faith Uh, how a Christian, how a disciple of Jesus is called to live. And so I want to spend some time on the foundation of love because I think it matters. So this week I went to the dictionary and I said, well, if we're going to talk about love, let's see what the dictionary has to say. Here's some definitions. It's a strong affection. It's a warm attachment. It's a physical attraction. It's a score of zero in tennis. And I still remember as a kid watching a tennis match on TV for the first time, and it was like 30 love, and I'm like, what does that mean? You know, and I had to have it described or, or defined for me. So, so yes, even love, I guess, is involved in tennis. Well, then I went to YouTube, because who doesn't go to YouTube to find great material, right? And so I looked up, uh, where is the love? And, of course, the Black Eyed Peas came on, uh, one of my favorite bands and songs. And if you want to be challenged this week, watch their video. Um, that they created for Where is the Love because it's, it's in your face and it's going to make you see things that, that, yes, are swimming all around us and it's addressing the question, can we find God's love in the midst of that? As a matter of fact, another video that they just created this last year is called Big, Big Love and that one is particularly difficult for me to see because it deals with the violence within our schools and, and those kinds of things going on in our world and it just makes you... Uh, pause and and live in the midst of that struggle but then ask that question and that's why I showed that video today from the kids because I think the kids can show us and remind us yet again that we're called to find that love well then I typed in what's love got to do with it and guess who came up (laughs) Tina Turner folks now you young folks up in the balcony I know you don't know who Tina Turner is right Some of you do. Danielle, thanks for raising your hand, but most people don't. Well, Debbie told me this morning there was an article in the newspaper that Tina Turner actually needed a a new kidney, and her husband was a match, and he gave her his kidney. What's love got to do with it, Tina? It's got everything uh, to do with it, right? Everything to do with it. That's what love is. Well, of course, uh, I thought you guys probably know enough about love that I wouldn't have to preach long, so I came up with a sermon quiz. And if you get all these right, I'll just sit down and go home, okay? But if not, I'll preach a little bit longer. So here we go. What is the most significant four-letter word in the world? Okay, you guys are good. What are the three hardest words in the world to get right? Okay. The most important thing is not to think much, but to... Some of you aren't answering. You're going to make me preach, folks. <laughs> start, start getting your, your, yourself into this. True or false, love means never having to say you're sorry. False. Whew. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, please forgive me, please forgive me, right? Um, forgiveness and, and giving forgiveness and being forgiven is huge in love. So we blank because God first blanked us. Okay, you're close. Uh, Jesus' followers should be known as the greatest blank in the world. You got it. You got it. You should be the greatest lovers in the world as we're out there in our workplaces doing what it takes to bring God's life and love uh, to all. Um, At the end of life, these are the 11 words that most want to hear. I'll miss you. I'll miss you. You made an impact in my life. Thank you for pouring yourself into me. I forgive you, and I love you. And according to um, a hospice study that was recently done, if you could just be told one thing in those final moments of your life, the thing that you'd most want to hear is, I love you. What else needs to be said? Because that's what you're gonna hear when you meet God face to face. 
God's radical poured out love. And we want to experience that heaven on earth right here and right now. Amen? And so you were good, but not good enough. I'm going to keep going. So I believe whatever it is you give yourself to in life, whatever gets your attention, that's going to grow. And if the world wants to give itself to a vision of hate, hate is going to grow. If you want to give your life to a life of greed, greed is going to take up center space in your life and it's going to grow. But if you want to give yourself most fully to a life of love and concentrate on that and growing that, then love is going to grow. It's going to increase. And we need more of that kind of love. Well, we hear in 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul writing that love is patient, love is kind, it's not rude or arrogant or boastful. It doesn't insist on its own way, yada, 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 yada. And it says faith and hope and love, and the greatest of these is love. And then at the very end, three words that are really powerful. It says, love never ends. Yes, God's love is never going to end. That's going to continue because it's infinite. And that is the thing that is sure. That is the thing that's given. And so in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 14, another powerful verse, and this is from the message version. It says, Christ's love has moved me to such extremes that his love has the first and the last word in everything that I do. Oh, can you imagine rising up to love, 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 and the next day getting after it again? Christ's love has so changed me, so changed my heart, so is in the vision of everything that I see that that's what I'm going to give my life to. That's how I'm going to respond no matter what else is going on around me. Well, Jesus talked about a lot about loving neighbor and it was one of his primary teachings and it's why he taught and healed and loved the way that he did. It's what he showed his disciples. And I think Jesus was trying to say that the loving of one's neighbor is the birth act of a new humanity that actually as you go out and you practice that in your home and in your neighborhood in the world, you're actually birthing a brand new humanity that will live out of that love for the sake of all, no matter what's going on. But it's easy, right, when you like your neighbor or when they're nice or when they look like you and act like you and talk like you and behave like you, right? But to love somebody who's difficult, or who has caused pain, or who has brought about suffering in the world, that's a little bit harder to imagine. But Jesus also taught about this. You see, he grew up in the temple, and he would have been well-versed in the Hebrew Shema that we are to love the Lord our God with our whole heart, soul, and mind, and to love our neighbor as ourselves, but go to the Gospel of John. And he says, yes, you've been told that, but you were also told, hate your enemy. And I'm telling you, no, love love your enemy. And for those disciples and for everyone around, they would have been shocked because Jesus and the disciples and all people, they were being ridiculed. They were being held underfoot. They were being put on crosses. And yet Jesus pointed to the highest vision of love. It's quite radical. And so I see this as this drawbridge That instead of keeping the drawbridge up that keeps people apart, we lower down the drawbridge to allow people to cross over and to come face to face and to try to actually figure this out of how to bring more love into the world. And so in the Greek New Testament, there are two primary aspects of love that Jesus talks out of. Number one is the Greek word phileo, and phileo is like brotherly or sisterly love. So, Marsha, I got your back, and you got my back, right? And that's a brotherly and sisterly love. But the day that Marsha maybe doesn't have my back, I'm just going to desert her and go and find a different brother or sister. Instead of constantly living that out, in some ways it falls short. It's not fully complete. It's not the highest vision that God has. For Jesus, he talks about the Greek word agapao. Say agapao. Agapao is is a disciplined choice. It's an action. It's a, a, a way of living, a way of pouring out love that's unconditional. And you just keep loving at all times, but you choose to do that over and over and over and over again, no matter what. Well, this is important. So in the Gospel of John, Jesus is having a breakfast meeting with some of his disciples. And his best friend, what's his name? 
Peter, okay, Peter, his best friend. And in the Greek, now in the English, this is, I'm going to geek out in Greek on, on, on you for a second. Is that okay? So in the English, it says, hey, Peter, do you love me? And he responds saying, yes, Lord, I love you. So love is love is love, right? It just, it's there. In the Greek, this is where we see what's really going on. Jesus says, hey, Peter, do you agapao me? And Peter responds by saying, yes, Lord, I phileo you. So Jesus asks it two more times. No, Peter, do you agapao me? Are you going to choose to love me when I'm hanging on that cross? Are you going to choose to love when you're out there in the world sharing this message of hope and mercy and love with others when people are demeaning and devaluing and tearing you down? Peter, do you agapao me? And three times he responds, yes, Lord, I phileo you. He just doesn't quite get it. And I think for us in the church, even though we try to live it, a lot of times we don't get it. And we fall short. And that's why we need each other to show each other, to remind each other that we are called to a higher and a bigger and a bolder vision that God has in mind. And that's agapao. And so can you command someone to have a feeling or emotion for someone else? You can't. You can't say, I want you to feel love for somebody. That doesn't work. But you can choose, command, direct, make it happen. That's what agapao is. You choose to intentionally love even if it's hard to do it. This is why it's called the great commandment that Jesus gives as he's washing feet and he's feeding before his, his uh, crucifixion and resurrection. It's not called the great idea, the newest concept. It's called the great commandment, the new commandment that I give, and it's all about action-oriented, intentional, disciplined, cho choosing to love. So again, church, love is not a feeling. Love is a verb. Love is how you behave toward other people, and how you behave toward other people is a choice. Jesus commands us to love, amen? And so in 1 John, it says that God is love. And I love these words in 1 John because if it says God is love, it's the very essence, the very being, the very heartbeat, the very purpose of God is to love, which means God can do nothing else but love. Church, that's radical. I'm gonna say that again. God as love, God being love, God can do nothing else but love. And in my 40 plus years of life, I've been told God is a lot of other things and God is love. No, the very essence, the very being, the very heartbeat of God is love and God can do nothing else. And if we could really grasp that kind of agapao, that kind of agape love, and we actually sought to live that in the world, would it change our world? Would it transform lives? I believe it would. That's why it's so radical and that's why God calls us to it. Out of great love, God creates. Out of great love, God forgives. Out of great love, God resurrects. And so church, where is the love? Well, God is love and that love resides within you. God's kids, God's people. Here in a minute, a baptism, a cross, named and claimed for love with purpose in God's world. And so I want to leave you with this challenge because a lot of us will say, this sounds good and I think I'm doing it even though I struggle with it sometimes, but how do I step further into it? How do I go a little bit deeper? I think sometimes it comes back to the kinds of questions that we ask, the ways that our mind think. And so here's a, a slight change of focus that could make all the difference in the world. A lot of us will say, as a question for our lives, what do I want? But instead of that being our leading edge, what if the leading edge was, what is wanted of me? You see the difference? Instead of saying, what are my needs? We ask the question, what is God needing of me right here and right now with this one wild and crazy life that I've been given? Am I on top? Have I achieved? Am I number one? Am I all that? Instead saying, am I on tap for God to use? Hmm big difference in those statements. How can I chart my path versus how can I follow God's path? Take charge of your life. Rise up and do what you need to do 
and said, no, let God take charge of your life, however crazy that might seem. And instead of looking in and how special you may be and how wonderfully made you are, yes, that's important, but instead testifying to God's love, going out and sharing with people, this is how God's love and the love that people have given me, this is how it's changed my life. And this is why it's radical. This is why it's a new thing. And so Grace, get out there into the world and love as though the world depends on it, as though your life depends on it, because it actually does. God's love is the transformational fuel that you, the church, and the world so desperately needs. And God's people say, Amen. Thanks for watching. I hope this video can further the discussion of your relationship with Christ, either at home or maybe in the comments below.